Hello and welcome back to the Student Coach Podcast. Before we get into today's podcast, I just want to talk about last week's episode with Anthony Arnold, where we spoke about culture in sport. And it's helped me to evaluate the cultures in the clubs that I currently coach at. So like I mentioned in the podcast, uh, at my career club, the culture is highly focused on developing the juniors and developing the junior system, getting them prepared to play in our first and second team in the coming future. However, the culture at UConn Volleyball Club is slightly different. So theoretically, the club is split into two sides, which have different cultures. So you've got the social element, which focuses on developing players as they're all pretty much new to the sport. But this is also keeping students active whilst at university and really helping them have a good time and make new friends whilst they're here. Whereas on the squad side of it, it's highly focused on winning at all costs, as many of these players have played for numerous years. They're playing at a reasonable level, um, but some of them are still new to the sport, so we've still got to develop players to push them further. So I think assessing your club's culture is quite important when you're trying to attract new players, whether you're a player yourself or a coach, because... You want them to buy into the ethos that the club's invested heavily in. And if they're not investing in it as much as you are, the rest of the team are, then it may not be the best fit. Um, So without further ado, let's get into today's podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Student Coach Podcast. Today I'm joined with Kirsten, one of my course mates here at the University of Central Lancashire. Kirsten, how are we? I'm all good. How are you, Toby? I'm very well, thank you. Um, Today we're going to be talking about issues in female sport. Uh, we had a lecture on it the other week and it was quite interesting so I wanted to speak to a female coach about it just to gauge some further insights really. But first of all Kirsten, question I ask all my guests is how did you get into coaching and who do you coach now? Uh, so I currently coach a men's team, um, an open age men's team in the Lancs if they did free. So they're called Lions FC. Um, there was originally a pub team that had worked their way up to become a nice big FA team now. Um, and I got into coaching through really being, when I was at college, um, I played for football for Blackburn Rovers and they gave me an opportunity to go out to the younger age groups and deliver some sessions that we planned in the classroom. And that then inspired me to then know that I could then go out and inspire other people in my career. Brilliant. So, um, like I said, we're going to be talking about issues in female sports. So, why do you think that there's so many barriers into females coaching in male sports? So in the professional game, we don't see, well, there's none in uh, professional football at the moment. So why do you think that is? Um, I think that's just through like lack of opportunities. I think give it 10 years as and like females will start to come through, but stereotypes from 10 years ago were all women can't play football, women can't do this, women can't do that. So going into 10 years time when at the minute, like promoting female football is very high, not just mm-hmm. playing, but also coaching, that the coaches will thrive through in the next five to 10 years, definitely. But then even when you're looking at the Women's Super League, there's still a lot of male coaches in the female side of the sport. So how can we get more females even coaching female sports, do you think? Um, I think that's just through like lack of opportunities because like, especially when I was growing up being like grassroots player, the, the opportunities that, boys clubs got compared to girls clubs was like massive so I feel like if you were to even out the opportunities for both girls and boys then girls would inspire to carry on a a future with the sporting career. So how do you think that we can get more females into coaching because obviously on our course there's probably what five girls and then nearly 20 males so how do you think we can get more females involved do you reckon? Yeah, it's definitely a very male-heavy course, but for me, it doesn't affect me, whereas I know other girls, it, it does quite heavily affect them, that sometimes that the group they're only ever coaching with or working with is males. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think going forward, that if you was to be, like, from my point of view, if I was to go out and to try and inspire other people, I would go to girls' team rather than boys' team because I think, naturally, boys have the urge to go and carry on with football later on in their life because there's so many opportunities. They can go and play grassroots and all things like that. Whereas women at grassroots level, it stops at under 18. And for any team above under 18 at women at the minute, you have to trial for. So I think 
for me, I would go and talk to the younger age group of saying like the options are there. You can take so many options with just playing football, whether it is coaching, whether it's managing, because obviously they're totally different roles. Whether mm-hmm. you want to go into analysis, playing, there's so many options that people just don't understand. They all think it's boys only. So do you think that's something more that national governing bodies can do because so like offering more um, opportunities for females? So like you said then, anything above under 18s you have to trial for. Do you reckon there should be the equivalent of what we have in um, male football? So like Sunday league, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So, the, it, so when you look at the league systems, they're very similar already. Sunday league and stuff like that. But the teams that they're already, they're all national. Um, like associated with national league mm-hmm. clubs, there's very few that are classed as a grassroots club, yeah. and then all of them that you still have to, they, you have to trial to get into a club at, for a woman of, of any age above under 18s anyway. So I think if you were to not even just create new clubs or create a new league, just turn around to some of the clubs and be like, if you want to get more players, like you need to make your teams more accessible for all. You don't need trials. You mm-hmm. turn up your play all just like you can in the men's leagues. Yeah. So this is been a very controversial topic recently it's been all over social media all over the news and um uh, regarding leah thomas is it the transgender swimmer in the ncaa um, yeah so what are your thoughts on transgender females competing in female sports um i think it's quite wrong due to like the the way they've grown up they've always been male they're like hormones and things like that are all male so they're generally a lot bigger in muscle bigger in size mm-hmm. more aggressive than women as it is um obviously the, the, she's taking tablets at the minute to become more female like but she'll still carry the characteristics and traits of a male automatically mm-hmm. um obviously after having the lecture a few weeks ago covering her i actually did some research off it and if you actually look at her scores from when she first competed in a women's swim she didn't get first. She got last in her first seven races. She then progressed up and up before mm. she actually won. And it was like the, she'd done like 30-odd races before she actually won a race. And it was only that when she's winning it that the, the news is out there. So I think I think it all depends on how well you do in the sport or whether it's like right or wrong. But it's how they define, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we also spoke about... I believe it's Casta Semenya, the Jamaican runner who has to take uh, tablets tablets to reduce her testosterone levels, even though she's a female. And yeah. I personally think that's wrong in general because she shouldn't have to be punished because of how her body works. But I just really want to know what your opinion is on that. No, I totally agree with you, Toby. Um, I think that like, she's basically being punished bef- because of something like she developed. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she hasn't chosen purposely to take more testosterone and then she's been found out so has to decrease it. It's just something she was born with. Um, I think it's a bit like, it's just, it's tight on her. Imagine if like I was to go and do a sport and then I'd have to be punished because I was too tall or something. But mm-hmm. I, I don't think it's right that she's being punished for something she can't change. Mm-hmm. Whereas obviously with the swimmer, she's chosen that herself. So she's not being punished by telling herself, like, being told to take testosterone reducers mm-hmm. as it is. She, that's a choice for her. That's a lifestyle yeah. change. Whereas the runner obviously isn't. It's mm-hmm. it's nothing she can change. It's her own body. Mm-hmm. So we were, in the lecture, we spoke about um, periods and menopause within women and how that affects performance, which I personally didn't know anything about. I didn't realise it had that much of an effect. It's, so do you think this should be spoken about more in the media or publicly with coaches and players so that they can understand why one week they might be on top of the game, next week they've had a massive collapse and they're playing awful? Um, absolutely, 100%. Um, obviously, people choose to take tablets and forms of contraception to stop the periods and things like this. So I think if you're you as a coach, you knew whether your players were like going to be affected by hormones and because everyone everyone reacts differently to it like mm-hmm. I'm quite lucky it doesn't affect me in any way shape or form but I know peers and colleagues and people I play with they get bloated very very easily and mm-hmm. they then get off the performance just through like something they can't change whereas I know a lot of professional athletes who 
I've been around, I've spoken to, they do take contraception to stop it, just to try and keep the performance levels at the highest. And then their break is obviously always when there's an international break, or they know there's yeah. got like a gap between the um, games, so they, they can take it at the right time for them. Um, but I do agree that a lot of coaches don't have any clue and any knowledge about it, which and it does affect a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, being a being a girl and being in the situation all the time is is something that people need to be aware of. Um, going into the media, I think maybe not quite like make it a big public thing, mm-hmm. but just like general knowledge of like when you when you're taking your FA level one or your FA level two, yeah. like about it in your course, like look if you're going to teach a girls club, like this could be a massive effect and from anything really from like under 12s to all the way up mm. it can it needs to be taken into consideration like I would say from coaching a few different ages under 13s to 14s in girls is the hardest part because they're going through a change of mm-hmm. a full the, the, the growing up they're taking for they're going from a little girl to a woman and that's their hardest part in life and yeah. trying to wash it you, all your hormones are everywhere you bodies changing things like this it's very hard to try and deal with at the same time mm. but like I say I don't think you should put it out into the media yeah. you might want to say like going forward like coaches should learn more about it but mm-hmm. if you was to integrate it into your courses it'd be miles better than going out socially mm. so my final question for you Kirsten is what issues have you seen within sport whether it's as a player or a coach but what have you seen that may have affected you or affected some of your colleagues or teammates? Um, for me, mainly, it's when I've been coaching. So I've been coaching a men's league and that at the minute I'm the only uh, women woman coach there in that league um, that we play in. So every Sunday it's like, oh, there's like a girl there, so I'll, what's she doing? Mm. Um, one of my worst ones was I was, was playing a game and uh, we didn't have any subs, so I offered to do the line. Um, and I, I'm not biased at all. I'll do everything fairly. I want both teams to have the same mm. amount of chance, things like that. I'm not bothered if our team loses, if we get beat by the better team. Um, so I was doing the line and I was on the opposite side to where we were standing, so with the away ends, and they was chipping in my ear the whole game. And then the next thing you know, the ref under sees it and tells me to come off the sideline because um I'm being like basically abused for my sexuality mm. and like so um I'm like, well, I, I'm not bothered. I will, I, I will take through this and I'll stand mm. it. I'll stand them up. I'm not bothered. But the ref didn't see that, and he could see that things were going to escalate quite quickly. And mm. for the coming away from it and reflecting on it, he definitely did it for the best of me that to not knock my confidence too much. But then when I've then looked into it, that got fined and things like this all through. It's like racial abuse, but burst, yeah. basic. Um, so that's mainly the main thing for me, but. I've seen a lot of opportunities. So, like, a bit like when I was at college, um, I played at Blackburn Rovers. So, there was, like, three boys' teams to one girls' team. So, every time, like, mm. we game, it was, like, quite a big thing for us, whereas, like, the boys were playing in and out every week, yeah. three games a week, whereas we was, like, scraping one week, one game every two weeks. It was it was always mm. quite hard. Um, but I think going forward in the next few years with the plans that the FA have put in for girls to play football, the initiatives have started to run, it really is, it really is on the on the on the up. Um, I don't know what you think about. Have you heard anything with the initiatives that run or anything? Yeah, so DCB have done a lot of initiatives to get more uh, girls and women involved in cricket. So at my cricket club, we have a, a softball women's team, uh, which was set up two or three years ago. It's a lot of the junior parents' mums. Uh, just having a laugh, having a few Proseccos after. Um, yeah. And it's just getting more people involved in sport because it gives them something to look forward to. They're still being active and they can, if they're involved as well, it gives them, um, they can relate to their child's um, activities more. So they understand more about what they talk about if they talk about um, after one of the games or something like that. But I've had plenty of the women's softball players coming to me for one-to-one coaching as well. And it's been great to see how serious they're taking it, even though it's just like a friendly league. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've been in like similar situations where coaching with foot cricket as well. Um, so I've played cricket up at, like, I still play cricket now at a mm-hmm. women's team. 
that are also associated with the men's team, but collectively the the one club whereas I know a few clubs are like the women's is quite separate from the mm-hmm. men's. Um and like you said, the the mums playing the softball, there's like that uh festival something, isn't there? The, yeah. The Prosecco festival that mm-hmm. you go and basically just get drunk and that very often encourages a lot of people to come down and watch and mm-hmm. then get inspired more than just playing. Um but then at the same time that at the other club that I'm associated with, the other cricket club, there's no women team at all. Mm. Um, there's a junior squad that has like three different age ranges because it's a lot smaller of a club. And across the juniors, there's only six girls. So mm. that's like uh, women's needs to be promoted in that side. Whereas then I'm also associated with a club that the women's is already, already big. Yeah. So going forward, I'd love to try and create a smaller club into a, a bigger, a bigger club and get the women's side on it. Mm-hmm. But um at the smaller club, I'm helping out with the All Stars and Dynamos in this coming season. Mm-hmm. So being an activator there will help to inspire the younger, younger girls that come down. Because I did it last summer, and quite often the girl to boy ratio was like pretty even. Mm. Uh, whereas going up to juniors, that's when it then starts to differ, and the the boy ratio always increases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Well, um, thanks for coming on today, Kirsten. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you for having me, Toby. My pleasure. And I'll see you all in the next one.